Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sharita Golden, Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer of Johns Hopkins Medicine and Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And I wanna welcome you to this afternoon's forum, a community forum with Dr. Kismikia Corbett, everything you should know about the COVID-19 vaccine. So I first wanna just start off by thanking um, all of our co-sponsors for this event. So in addition to the Johns Hopkins Medicine of uh, Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Health Equity, um, we are very grateful to the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity, the um, Urban Health Institute of Johns Hopkins University, the Center for Public Health and Human Rights at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, our Center for Immunization Research at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, our vaccine, our Johns Hopkins Vaccine Initiative at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, as well as our Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions. So just a few housekeeping things throughout our webinar. So this um, presentation is being recorded, so you likely got a notice to accept the recording. Um, there will be a question and answer session. So we ask that you enter your questions for the presenters um, in the chat. Um, they will be answered live or with short typed answers where possible. And click the thumbs up button to bring popular questions to the top of the Q&A window. Um, this is also being closed captioned. So we will read um, live captions. They'll be auto generated. Next slide. So we wanna start out with an acknowledgement of indigenous and racial inequities. And um, we acknowledge that Johns Hopkins University and our schools are on the traditional and contemporary lands of indigenous peoples. Our campus is on unceded lands of the Piscataway and Susquehanna people. Today, there are more than 7,000 indigenous people in Baltimore city, including members of the Piscataway, Lumbee and Eastern Band Cherokee. We acknowledge the history of oppression and systemic inequities while representing all tribal nation sovereignty. We strive to do our own work to address the inequities and disparities in Black, Indigenous, and people of color's experience while expanding partnerships with and following the leads of those communities. We have an exciting lineup of panelists and speakers today that will be joining us and um, um, they will each be introduced as they come to um, um, the webinar. So I just wanna thank all of them for their time and commitment as we all seek to achieve, achieve equity and vaccine access and distribution. And so just briefly, um, our agenda is um, that um, we will have our speaker introduction. We will have a presentation by our keynote speaker, Dr. Kazmikia Corbett, followed by a very distinguished panel. And then we will subsequently move to our Q&A session um, with you who are our audience. So it next gives me um, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Beyer who is a Desmond M. Tutu Professor of Public Health and Human Rights and founding director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Public Health and Human Rights at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he will introduce our esteemed speaker. So thank you, Dr. Beyer. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Golden. Wonderful to be with you all. It really is a, an honor and a pleasure uh, to welcome to Johns Hopkins uh, this extraordinarily exciting uh, young scientist. Uh, who has contributed so much uh, to the development of the really the first highly efficacious uh, COVID-19 vaccines, Dr. Uh, Kismikia Corbett. So Dr. Corbett um, is, a, uh, is at the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH. That's the NIH center that is tasked with doing basic science on vaccines. That is under uh, our beloved Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's the head of of uh, NIAD, um, and uh, she is the senior research fellow and the scientific lead for coronavirus vaccines, uh, an immunopathogenesis team uh, at the VRC. Uh, and it is in that role, she has been there since 2014, uh, that Dr. Corbett has played such important roles uh, in the development of these vaccines as you'll hear from. 
Uh, she is a graduate of the University of Maryland for her undergraduate degree. She's originally from North Carolina. And then she did her doctoral uh, dissertation work on immunology of viruses uh, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which as many know is an extraordinarily strong uh, program. Uh, she uh, has really uh, emerged uh, uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the work that she was already doing on uh, messenger RNA vaccines for other diseases. And of course, swiftly pivoted as the Vaccine Research Center did uh, to turn their attention to this new virus, this new human uh, pandemic, uh, and then to work with incredible speed, but also incredible scientific acumen uh, to uh, help develop in, in very short order a candidate vaccine, uh, and then to bring that vaccine uh, through all the safety and efficacy trials. Um, and here we are with an emergency use authorization uh, and beginning to use uh, this really powerful new tool of public health. So it is really a, a distinct honor and a pleasure, uh, first, uh, Dr. Corbett, to welcome you to Johns Hopkins and to our wonderful Baltimore community, uh, and then also to ask you um, to speak to, to the really uh, path-breaking, groundbreaking scientific work that you have done and for which we are all so deeply grateful. Please. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be back in Baltimore, albeit from my couch uh, with my birthday balloons behind me, um, because I actually went to undergrad in Baltimore County at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, during which time I was a major in biology, but also um, uh, took on a second major in sociology and did some research on health disparities in Baltimore City. Um, under a sociology professor at UMBC. And so I have always had a, a heart um, for Baltimore City and, and really for um, really Baltimore's uh, way of opening my eyes to health disparities, which essentially um, drove me into this, this vaccine development career, so to speak. Um, so it is a pleasure to be here. Um, further, I think I should, should just go out of the way to say it is something that we don't see a lot with academic institutions and multiple departments coming together to do something like this, which is community facing. Um, many of the talks that I have been given have been strictly science. And when I say, can you open up to the community? Um, most, most universities have no idea how to even do that. And so to Hopkins for, for taking the lead um, in that sphere, I am um, so grateful because it is now time for us to step away from the scientific podia um, and, and really talk about these vaccines to the community as it affects their health. Um, without further ado, um, I will talk a little bit briefly about um, what was introduced as um, in the last administration, Operation Warp Speed, which is what these vaccines came out of, but really um, telling people in the community about the things that they didn't necessarily know about the coronavirus vaccine development, particularly the one that we at the National Institutes of Health and the Vaccine Research Center um, played a large role in developing in collaboration with Moderna. And so I wanted to break down the timeline of development um, firstly to, to really um, hopefully help people to understand that while so-called warp speed, there was really no irresponsibility um, at play in, during the vaccine development process. So again, I am Kismikia Corbett and I am the scientific lead of the coronavirus vaccine team at the NIAID Vaccine Research Center. And this is everything you should know about coronavirus vaccines. Um, it goes without saying that we are now in our third wave of COVID-19 that has hit the United States. You can see these three arrows, firstly starting about a year ago in early spring, and then a second wave that began in the early summer. And now the third wave that started in late fall around Thanksgiving and doesn't seem to be letting up at all. This particular graph shows the entire United States. However, I do wanna show you that Baltimore really lays the top of that graph with the three waves as well. And as was mentioned in, um, in, in the introduction here is that it goes without saying that Baltimore with a large African-American population 
really suffers from a large amount of health disparities in regards to COVID-19 cases and also deaths. So it is estimated that we need about 70% population immunity to be established in order for us to get back to our normal lives. And so if we um, had to rely on natural infection um, for that, we could assume that about 40 million people would have to succumb to COVID-19 around the globe. So those numbers are around what we saw in 1918 with the, with the Spanish flu. And that's where vaccine comes into play, is needed in order to prevent the dynamics of this pandemic. A global race to find treatments for the sick and a vaccine to protect the healthy. This ends with most or all of us being immune to this virus, and ideally that's through a vaccine. Can solutions that usually take years. We are trying to move as fast as we possibly can. Be found in a matter of months. It is an extremely revolutionary approach to get into a phase one clinical trial 66 days after the sequence of a virus is released is a world record. And so, as we said in that video, in order to really change how this virus transmits and the dynamics of this pandemic, we will need a vaccine. So what does a COVID-19 vaccine actually do? There's really two sides to this story. The first of which is the benefit to the individual, as you've heard about. So these vaccines have about 95% efficacy against prevention of COVID-19 disease. So that is the benefit to you as one person or the prevention of infection. On the other hand, there is the community benefit whereby vaccines can potentially reduce transmission and ultimately make it safer for us to resume our normal activities. So I posted a thread on Twitter um, that got widely retweeted and it was my real sociologist view of how vaccines work and that vaccination in my view is community service. And the reason why we say that is because population or so-called herd immunity is the way that vaccines are able to really stop the trajectory of viral spread. So I have these stick figures on this slide where the blue people are people that are not immune to COVID-19. The green people are people that are immune to COVID-19. So if you have a non-immune versus a, a population versus a population that is largely immune, what happens when the virus is transmitting in the non-immune population is that there are high levels of transmission. So those people that were blue then turn red as they get infected with COVID-19. On the other hand, in a population that is largely immune, the people that are, are green cannot be touched by the virus at all. So only the people that are blue have the chance of becoming red. And so you can see there's really only a sprinkling of people that are um, able to be infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. And so you have low levels of transmission. Unfortunately, for those people that are red, there are detrimental outcomes that come from this virus. We all know them, but um, there is about 1% of those people who unfortunately die as a result of getting COVID-19. And so we need a vaccine. And the reason why we started to do this uh, so-called rapid uh, development of these vaccine candidates is because we really just knew exactly what to do. There was the necessity as the virus started to continue to spread around the globe and the latter parts of last year and the, and, um, sorry, the latter parts of 2019 and the beginning of, of, of 2020, we knew that all we needed were the sequences of the virus in order to fully um, um, start our development process in collaboration with Moderna. So the sequences of the virus, which was at the time called the 2019 novel or in coronavirus sequences were published on January 10th. And then we were able to quickly, and as we say in a world record, go into phase one clinical trial in only 66 days. How? Because one of the things, again, that a lot of people do not know is that we had extensive work on other coronaviruses that, had a, that led us to have a portfolio of data and also patent pending technologies that allowed us to monopolize on those and move very quickly. 
So from the time of about 2013 until 2019, we studied coronaviruses in so many various different directions in order to really understand how to make a really good vaccine to them. And the way that we did that is by looking at very atomic level detail of just one specific protein that sits on the surface of a coronavirus. It's called the spike protein. It's this beautiful mushroom shaped protein that you see on your screen. And it is the protein that um, I like to say reaches out its hand in order to grab onto your cell um, in, order to get, in order to push the virus into your cell and start an infection. So from that, you really need to do is prevent that in some way. And so if you can just specifically target your vaccine response towards that spike protein, then you're really good to go. And so we studied that protein in so much detail that we were able to see it on very mi micro mi uh, microscopic level in order to say, this is exactly what we need to do to this protein to make it a good vaccine. And so that's what we did. We added a few mutations. We studied how stable the protein was in the laboratory. We tested it in small animal models like mice for the last six years. And not only just the protein, but how to deliver that protein via a vaccine platform that was um, starting to become up and coming with a company called Moderna. So Moderna is a biotechnology company in Massachusetts and they use messenger RNA to largely deliver cancer therapeutics. But the really cool thing about their technology is that it's fast. So it's good if you're going to be using it for a vaccine development in a pandemic. It's reliable because it upholds a manufacturability standard that the FDA loves um, and that has been tried and true for several years. And it's universal to the point of which they have this really solid platform and all you need to know is what really good therapeutic protein to put inside. And so we essentially in collaboration with them dropped our really good protein into the backbone of their platform which allows us to deliver messenger RNA for just the spike protein of the coronavirus into your muscle and your muscle cells read that message almost like a Snapchat message and it takes a picture or screenshot, so to speak, of the message for the spike protein. And then your body learns in really intricate detail what that spike protein looks like. And because your body knows what that spike protein looks like, if you come in contact with the virus later, you can defend yourself against that viral infection and thus have a 95% less chance of getting COVID-19 disease. And so it was really interesting because we studied this in really what we call in science an academic fashion um, with Moderna. We were really just interested in using our protein with their platform and just understanding what types of immune responses we would get. But we kind of got really good at it and also had a very friendly um, uh, collaboration with them. So much so that it was really easy to, um, at the time when those sequences came out to say, Let's go for it. And this obviously came from the people with the pocketbooks, like the CEOs of the companies um, and the Anthony Fauci's, et cetera. But to say, let's go for it and to initiate the um, development or the production of clinical grade material in order to really move quickly into the clinic is something that is unprecedented. So one of the things that is happening is that what you're seeing is nine months of very rapid or warp speed development, but a lot of forethought that went into that, so much so that co a company CEO and um, the director of a nat the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases trusted millions of dollars towards making the clinical product. So it only took four days in order for the clinical product production to start. And then after that, 41 days until Moderna was able to ship that clinical drug product to the clinical trial sites, which really shows the utility of this very safe, and robust platform towards its manufacturability, which again, as I said, the FDA loves. We went into phase one clinical trial in March of last year. So we're about one year um, from the mark of which uh, the first person was dosed with mRNA-1273. I say that to say because one of the general concerns with the, with the public is that, oh, what about the long-term effects? 
Well, in about 45 people, we've known about their safety profile for now 10 months. And it looks good enough that um, we are even thinking about studying them with further uh, doses with some of the variant COVID-19 mRNAs. The other thing that a lot of people don't know about, or at least that wasn't publicized in the middle, is the part of which I led as a scientific lead for the coronavirus vaccine team at the Vaccine Research Center. These are all of those steps in February where none of us slept, where we were vaccinating mice, where we were validating how the um, mRNA expresses in cells, where we were testing the preclinical drug product, where we were publishing in very high tier journals around what the spike from that mRNA looked like, um, and where we were able to really say we need really good immunity and we can tell that because we put it into mice and we put it into monkeys and those data allowed the FDA to say on March 2nd, go for it. Now you are safe to proceed into humans. Um, after the phase one clinical trial starts, soon after getting the safety and um, the preliminary immunogenicity or immune responses in those first 45 people, we were allowed to then start our phase two clinical trial on May 29th. So everyone knows that the phase three clinical trial has begun. It began, um, I believe, the end of July, July 27th or 28th. These phase three clinical trials, not just for Moderna, but all in inclusive, um, at least under operation, so-called Operation Warp Speed, or what is now called the operation, are randomized placebo-controlled trials. So these trials are to beg the question, does the vaccine work, yes or no? And then also, how well in comparison to placebo, when no one has any idea whether they got placebo or vaccine or, um, or them or the doctors have any idea about that. So these vaccine groups and the placebo groups are split in half, 30,000 participants in total. 15,000 of them got vaccine, 15,000 of them got placebo. Uh, the president of the, my undergrad institution is uh, also on the panel today and he, actually partook in this phase three clinical trial, um, generously so. After the vaccine or the placebo was given, the volunteers do not know what they got and they are allowed to just go about their everyday normal lives. At which time they log their symptoms with, about, with side effects, but then also if they get anything from a slight headache to the sniffles, sore throat, anything that looks like it could be COVID, they are then called back to their trial site and diagnosed with either a COVID case or not. As those cases start to accrue, over the months of which the phase three are happening, we can start to determine what vaccine efficacy is we're having. And so vaccine efficacy is just a percentage of the COVID cases in the placebo group as compared to that in the vaccine group. Using these stick figures as just a quick little um, elementary mathematical example, if you had two volunteers in the placebo group, out of a total of 20 volunteers in all, so that means 18 of them got, um, um, sorry, two volunteers in the vaccine group, out of a total of 20 participants in all, meaning 18 of them got the placebo, then you have a 18 over 20 or 90% efficacy. Now, one of the things that other people also don't know about the phase three trial is not just how it worked, but also what type of people were actually in the phase three. It becomes a slight criticism um, in, in certain um, communities about whether or not you can trust the vaccine because you don't know whether or not the companies and the people who sponsored the clinical trials actually care to test the vaccine in your subgroup. In this case, absolutely we did is actually the reason why I was so frantic when I talked to Dr. Hrabowski because I, I wanted him to get in the clinical trial so we had at least one more African-American person because we were really interested in making sure that the volunteer demographics match the demographics of the United States of America, the population of the United States in, in all. So if you look here at the pie chart on the left side, you can see that we had about 10% African-American participants in the phase three clinical trial, 20% of people who identified as Hispanic and only 63% that were white. 
With comorbidities, so there were people who were enrolled in the phase three clinical trial who had well-controlled diabetes or severe obesity, um, cardiac disease, et cetera. And so all of these things coming together allowed for us to get a really clear picture across those 30,000 participants about various subgroups and how their safety and efficacy ranked when compared to everybody at all. Long story short, there was no difference in safety or efficacy in any of the subgroups or people with various comorbidities. So let's talk about the efficacy and safety of mRNA 1273. So this is the data from the interim phase three analysis. What does that mean? What that means is that about two weeks after people in the trial got their second dose of vaccine, so you get one dose on day one, and then you come back on day 29, so 28 days later or a month later, and you get your second dose. And then two weeks after that is when we start to, uh, um, start to count the number of cases. And what we saw is that in this very beautiful graph is that the placebo group in purple, as the cases started to accrue, it just became clearer and clearer that the vaccine was protecting. As you can tell, there were just little to no cases in the mRNA-1273 group. So the people that got vaccinated, out of all 15,000 of them, there were only 11 cases of COVID-19. And uh, Dr. Obowski is a mathematician, and I like to actually think of myself as a mathematician at heart <laughs> sometimes, and that's pretty darn good. Especially when you look at the placebo group where there were 185 symptomatic cases. And if you look at this bottom row here, you can see that even with the severe COVID cases, so these are cases of people who had to go to the hospital as a result of getting the virus that causes COVID-19, none of those people were in the vaccine group. So not only are we present, uh, um, sorry, um, preventing COVID-19 blanketly, but also even more so preventing severe COVID-19 with this vaccine. And let's talk about safety. So the way that we term this uh, by with the FDA, there are adverse events. So side effects, so to speak. A lot of the side effects that people feel are at the injection site, similar to what you feel when you get um, an influenza or a flu shot every year, where there is pain or swelling or redness at the injection site. And that's really generally what you feel after your first dose. And because I got my second dose on Monday, I can actually attest too that things are a little bit different after your second dose, but not alarmingly so. And also to be ex expected when you really think about what's happening in your body, where your immune system is working for the good in order to start to ramp up the amount of protective uh, antibodies that you need to protect yourself against COVID-19 later. So after that second dose, I can tell you personally what I felt. I came home and I was tired. So I had fatigue. Um, I had pain, in, uh, a pain in, in, in my arm where the injection site was. And a lot of people um, will feel this, a similar thing. So about 80% of people have one or more of the following symptoms after their second dose. Fever, headache, fatigue, muscle ache, joint pain, chills, nausea, but, this is not to say that it's something wrong with the vaccine. In fact, what it indicates is that everything is going just right, that you're eliciting a really, really, really good immune response to the vaccine. The things that um, have come up also in regards to safety or whether or not this vaccine, because it is genetic material, it is messenger RNA, and people like to, um, to, to note that DNA is what your body uses, right? Um, and so this messenger RNA cannot alter your DNA at all. It's just not how it works inside of your cell. There are also absolutely no fertility effects as resulting from getting this messenger RNA vaccine or actually any vaccine um, for that matter and no death. So I wanted to give just a really brief overview of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine pipeline in general. So I talk a lot about my baby, which is the Moderna vaccine candidate. However, 
there are over 200 vaccines that are being developed at some point um, in the vaccine uh, in the development pipeline across the globe, many of which are still in their preclinical phase because unlike us, they were not prepared with six years of preclinical data to allow them to go very quickly into phase one. Nevertheless, there are also many vaccines across the globe that are in phase one through three trials, six of which, including the now EUA approved Pfizer and Moderna candidates in the United States that are in limited use um, um, now, and zero that have been approved for full use across the, across the globe. So I talked a lot about the Moderna candidate. There's also the Pfizer-BioNTech candidate, which is also a mRNA vaccine platform, very similar to the Moderna candidate. Johnson & Johnson, which boasts that they might be able to protect after one uh, dose of their vaccine, is using an ad vector. And so what this means is they just take the virus, they scoop all of the guts and spike protein, and they allow the spike protein to go to your body by way of a just backbone of a cold, which is a really cool trick to trigger your immune system to prevent itself against that spike protein. AstraZeneca uses a similar technology. And then there's Novavax, which uses a protein. So they are giving the spike protein via what's called a nanoparticle. So just a very, 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 very small microscopic particle. I want you to point to a couple of things on this slide. Number one is that these vaccines, you're right, a lot of times you take lots of time, but the two that made it through the race first are messenger mRNA candidates, which goes to show just how quickly these types of vaccines can be developed. The second is in so many places on this slide, with the exception of AstraZeneca, I have the words pre-fusion stabilized. That term comes from our laboratory where we designed the protein sequence for the vaccine candidates, not just for Moderna, although we were most intimately involved in the development of that candidate, but also for Pfizer, BioNTech, Novavax, Johnson & Johnson, and dozens of other vaccines around the globe. And so it just also really points to the fact that studying very basic science led to this development process for this vaccine, not just very rapidly, but also very clearly, safely, and, 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 and effectively. The other thing that I want people to remember, not just around Moderna's candidate, but for all of the candidates, all inclusive, is that the same strict measures of vetting these vaccines via the FDA is used. And so there is some level of preclinical data that must be available in order for the FDA to even say that they could be used in humans at all. And many of these vaccine candidates have really good indications that they are going to elicit some level of efficacy. We know about the efficacy for the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech um, vaccines, but then also AstraZeneca's vaccine is showing between 60 to 90% efficacy in the phase three interim analysis. And I wake up about every day expecting to see some Johnson & Johnson data very soon. Um, and Novavax just began their phase three clinical trial. So we can, we can think that we might see some of those data start to come out in, in two, two and a half months. And without further ado, um, thank you so much for allowing me again to, to present to you all. And I will take some questions later. So oh, that was just fabulous. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Corbett. And I think your ability to really explain some very complex vaccine science in a way that everyone can understand has just really been um, an insightful um, part of this afternoon and really a highlight for us. So thank you so very much. And for all of your work, um, I think that for those of us who are scientists and physicians, you know, for many of this, th us, this is a ministry and a mission to care for our communities. And so we are just very grateful that there are scientists like you who share um, that mission and vision that many of us here at Johns Hopkins Medicine and Johns Hopkins University share. So thank you for that.